Hello, and welcome again to another edition of Wings of Hope. My name is Reverend Randall Johnson, and I'm so glad that you joined us today. The purpose of these messages that we've been sending you via email while those who are either at home or at work or possibly in the hospital is to encourage you to think about allowing the Almighty God and his son, Jesus Christ, to be in your life. And to open your mind, if you will, about another thought of a divine presence that can really make a difference if you give them a chance. If you will, if you have your Bibles, would you please open them to Genesis, reading from the sixth chapter, the fourth through the ninth verse. And it reads as follows. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were old men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart were was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and every creeping thing and the fowls of the air for it repented me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man and perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. No one can challenge or defeat the Almighty God is our thought for today. If you would, would you please bow your heads right where you are. Lord God, we thank you again 
for allowing us this opportunity to explore and examine your word from old. To see how the days of old relate to the days of now. Lord, we ask that you please let your mind and your will and your way be spoken through this word. That someone who, who might hear it, whether they be grieved in the heart for losing someone, or lying in bed, sick from a disease they don't know where it came from, or struggling in their mind full of anxieties, not knowing where their next meal is going to come from or how a bill will be paid. Please, oh God, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in, my, in thy sight. O oh Lord, thy strength, my strength, and my Redeemer. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. The poet Helen Steiner Wright once wrote, God hath not promised, skies always blue, flowing strong pathways all our lives through. God hath not promised, Sun without rain, joy without sorrow, peace without pain. But God has promised strength for the day, light for the laborer, rest for the laborer, excuse me, and light for the way, grace for the trials, help from above, unfailing sympathy and undying love. We're talking about no one can challenge and defeat the cause of Almighty God. It was Plato who declared, an unexamined life is a life, is, is, is an unexamined life is not a life worth living. Today, as we try and attempt to understand this coronavirus epidemic, we are completely surrounded by the news of not only the toll and the death toll that is constantly bombarding us, who are dying from this virus, but we are bombarded with the conflicting reports that our politicians throughout our world here on planet Earth are constantly and consistently sending to citizens of the world around on planet Earth and unfortunately here in America. And I have to hear, and I hear, and yet I have heard no one has made the announcement or the request that as a people and as a nation that we ought to pray about our situation. In 2 Chronicles 7.14 it reads, If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. I'm talking about no one can challenge and defeat the cause of Almighty God. On January 20th, 2020, the United States first discovered the first case of the Canaro virus. In the United States of America, according to Wikipedia, news that they report that over 956,375 confirmed cases of this virus have infected Americans. 102,430, I'm sorry, 102, 340,000 have recovered from this virus. And 53 deaths are the result of the Canora virus. I'm talking about no one can challenge and defeat the cause of Almighty God. The World Health Organization reports 2,886,000 539 confirmed cases of the canaro virus that have affected people. 811,666,000 people have recovered and, and 201, 502,000 deaths are the result of the canaro virus. I'm talking about no one can challenge or defeat the cause of Almighty God. 
History is a story, is a story of the fact that nothing and no one can challenge and defeat the cause of Almighty God. Pharaoh and the Egyptian army found this out when they were ready to fight Almighty God. And they found themselves at the bottom of the sea. I'm talking about no one can challenge and defeat the cause of Almighty God. King Nebuchadnezzar found this out when he attempted to destroy and kill the servants of the Most High God. We're talking about the three Hebrew children, Meshach, Shadrach, and a bad Negro named Abednego, and placed them into a fiery furnace that both the heat and the fires were increased seven times hotter than before they bound them up and threw them in hand and foot tied together. But they found out that the son of the living God stopped by and was present in the midst of the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro named Abednego. No one can challenge and defeat the cause of Almighty God. King Zenurachrib of the, of the Assyrian army chose to surround Israel with 185,000 men and rebuking King Hezekiah of Israel and Almighty God and claiming that they weren't Jack. Almighty God responds to King Sennacherib and the Assyrian army, sent a message to the prophet Elijah. And the message to the king Hezekiah was, hey, look, you can sleep in tomorrow. I'm going to take care of this personally. And God decided in one night to send one angel. And that one angel that God sent killed 185,000 men in one night. I'm talking about no one can challenge and defeat the cause of Almighty God. When the prophet Elijah woke up one morning and found himself completely surrounded by the king of Assyria in the city of Dothan. With the, and the prophet servant was terrified, asking the prophet, what on earth are we going to do with, an, with no army present to defend us? And Elijah's response, fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Then the prophet did something quite unique. He prayed a prayer to Almighty God and asked him to open the eyes of his servant that he may see what's standing behind him. And God did so. And when he did so, the servant looked up and saw a mountain full of horses and chariots of fire surrounding Elijah. I'm talking about no one can challenge and defeat the cause of Almighty God. When young King David had to face the Philistine giant Goliath and told Goliath, thou comest to me with the sword and the spear and with the shield, but I come to thee in the name of the, the Lord of hosts, the God of the Israel of army whom thou hast defiled. And on that day, we learn that the bigger they are, the harder they fall. No one can challenge and defeat the cause of Almighty God. Almighty God wants all his prophets, saints, and sinners to understand that there is no problem greater than he who happens to be the problem solver. I'm talking about no one can challenge and defeat the cause of Almighty God. I understand now why Moses declared in the fifth and final book of the Pentateuch, to the nation of Israel in Deuteronomy 10:17, which declares, For the Lord your God is a God of gods and the Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and a terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. I understand now why the prophet Nahum, who declared in Nahum 1:7, The Lord is good. He is a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. I understand now why the psalmist who declared, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help 
in trouble. I understand now why the prophet Isaiah declared, no weapon formed against thee will prosper. I understand now why the psalmist declared, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? I understand now why the prophet Amos declared, but let judgment run down as waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. I understand now why the prophet Isaiah again declared, Hast thou not heard? Hast thou not known? Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard? That the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither, neither is worried. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord, they shall be, he shall renew their strength. They shall mount up as wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Almighty God wants us to know to join his campaign and his endeavor because the Almighty God will always have the last word and the honor of God will never be polluted or defiled. Always remember, the Almighty God is still in charge, in control, and still has to command. I stop by to say again, there is no problem that God cannot solve. There is no situation that God cannot fix. There is no mistake that God cannot erase. There is no war that God cannot win. There is no death that the Almighty God cannot resurrect back to life. I'm talking about no one can challenge or defeat the cause of Almighty God. The question that plagues my mind is this. In lieu of the coronavirus pandemic, I do not understand why no one on the face of the earth and no one in America is willing to comply with Second Chronicles 714, which we read earlier. In our scripture lesson today, we will discover the reasons and the consequences for humanity's refusal to understand that no one can challenge or defeat the cause of Almighty God. There are three principles found in our scripture lesson today that should be noted as we investigate the reason why God cannot be defeated or challenged. They are eternal, essential, and escape. Eternal, essential, and escape. Eternal. Today, humanity refuses to recognize and respect and respond appropriately to the eternal wisdom of Almighty God. Job recognized man's narcissistic thinking when he carefully described the eternal wisdom of Almighty God in chapter 28 within the book of Job, chapter 28, 12 and the 13th verse, which he declared, but where shall wisdom be found? And where is a place of understanding? Man knoweth not the price thereof, neither is it found in the land of the living, but before we can even consider Job's observation about wisdom. Let us keep in mind and discover and examine, if you will, this a little bit about this Job that I've talked about twice here in messages earlier in this series. You see, Job knew firsthand just how we feel. I'm talking about everyone associated or knows about the Kanara virus. Because in the book of Job, we see the first case, believe it or not, of the Kanara virus inflicted only on one person. And that is Job. By the way, the person responsible for Job's dilemma is Satan himself. However, we really cannot appreciate what's happening to Job in the 28th chapter of Job until we read Job 
the first chapter, 6 to the 12th verse, which declares in the American Standard Version, Now it came to pass on the day when the sons of God came to present themselves before Jehovah, that Satan also came among them. And Jehovah said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered Jehovah and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And Jehovah said unto Satan, Hast thou not considered my servant Job? For there is none like him on the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that fears God, and turn away from evil. Then Satan answered Jehovah and said, Doth Job fear God for not? Has not thou made a hedge about him, about his house, and by all he has, on every side, on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and the substance is increased in the land. But put forth your hand now, and touch all that he had, and he will renounce thee to thy face. Jehovah said unto Satan, Behold, all that he has is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of Jehovah. See, what we don't realize, what's going on here right now has been before, but it was an eternal conversation. How do you know, or how do we know, that there was a conversation that took place between God and Satan about citizens of the world, about America, about your family, about communities. We don't know that. This passage of scripture brings a very interesting point, and that is this. How do we know that Almighty God and Satan was not talking about humanity one day? And God started bragging about the families the governments and the nations who feared God and who turned away from evil. And no one can say either it took place or it didn't that Satan had arguments similar to Job. God, take away your hand from those who claim who love you. Take away your hand of protection on all that they own and what they value most. And I bet you humankind will spit in your face. We cannot answer the question as to why the Almighty God would allow Satan so much leeway to disrupt, disturb, and discombobulate our lives. However, this story tells us that we never fully understand how the eternal wisdom of God operates. But we do know that Satan has to get permission from the authority to attack us in the first place. I'm talking about no one can challenge or defeat the cause of Almighty God. No one on earth can duplicate the awesome power of God. No scientist cannot reproduce him. No academic scholars can define him. No theologians can explain him. No military commanders can now strategize him. No military might can defeat him. This would include Satan. I'm talking about no one can challenge and defeat the cause of Almighty God. Now I understand the songwriter who wrote, Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he. Oh, his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches over me. I sing. Because I'm happy, I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know 
He watches over me. No one can challenge or defeat the cause of Almighty God. The second point is essential. We don't know if what we are going through has been an eternal discussion, but we do know an eternal discussion could have taken place. So that brings us to the point of what's essential. The one essential element that humankind operates from is not the mind, but the heart. No one knows us better than Almighty God. According to Genesis the 6, 5 and 6, it reads, And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented Jehovah that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Today, I have an announcement to make. Humanity, we have broken the heart of Almighty God. America, we have broken the heart of Almighty God. Please let me repeat this announcement. To every citizen around the world, I'm talking to every human being who resides on planet Earth. If you're within the sound of my voice, we as a human race have broken the heart of Almighty God. America, if you're within the sound of my voice, we have broken the heart of Almighty God. Especially when the political leaders and every American citizen does not recognize the model of America with its eat pro and it means out of many, one. Unfortunately, the saints who believe in God, the agnostics who, can, who are confused about God, and the atheists who don't not even recognize the existence of God, probably have never considered that Almighty God has a heart with feelings, and that his heart has been broken by humankind. The one question that we need to ask ourselves is this. Do I really care if I or if how I live my life has broken the heart of God? The one thing that makes it worse than breaking the heart of the Almighty God, and that is that we have hurt him so badly with our sinful mindset that he regrets even making us. We're talking about essential things here, people. In chapter 6, verse 7, it reads, And Jehovah said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and creeping things, and birds of the heavens, for it repented me that I have made, that I have made them. Pastor and theologian, Dr. Timothy Keller, author of the book, The Reason for God, Belief in an Age of Skepticism, tells us, a life not centered on God leads to emptiness. Just imagine if you've ever experienced a broken heart, you know how empty you feel. Just because the one you love does not want you, nor do they care about you, and it really hurts to know that the person you love rejects you without any good or logical reasons. Believe it or not, when we reject God totally, and we refuse to at least consider his feelings, this is sin. Although the dictionary can provide a concise definition of sin, theologians give a much better explanation for review and consideration. Again, theologian, pastor, and author Dr. Kimothy Keller of the book A Reason for God, Belief in the Skeptical Age declares, sin is a despairing refusal to find our deepest identity in our relationship and service to God. Sin is seeking to become oneself, to get identity apart from God. What does that mean? Everyone gets their identity, their sense of being distinct and valuable from something or someone. The famous Danish philosopher Søren Gullregard 
wrote a book called The Sickness Unto Death in 1849. He asserts that the human beings were made not only to believe in God, in some generation here or there, loving him supremely, centers their lives on him above all else and build and identify themselves through him. Anything other than that is sin. However, the good news is this. No matter how we reject God in our sinful mindset, and we turn our back on God, God will never turn his back on us. I understand now why the songwriter who wrote, Be not dismayed, whatever be tied. God will take care of you. Beneath the wings of love abide. God will take care of you. Through every day, all of the way, he will take care of you. God will take care of you. Now I understand the writer of 2 Peter when he declared in 2 Peter 8, third chapter 8 and 9 verses, which reads, Forget not this one thing, beloved, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some countless slackless, but as long-suffering to you toward not wishing that all should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Repentance means to change one's mind, to apologize. To those who have hurt and to show regret and remorse for breaking the heart of God or anyone else. I'm talking about no one can challenge or defeat the cause of Almighty God. Last but not least, escape. This brings me to the final and the most important point of all, and that is escape. In the days of Noah, humankind had nothing on their mind but evil thoughts and violence was the only way of life. All they did was fight each other and kill each other. Everyone or no one bought anything at a store like civilized citizens. They, they stole it from their neighbors. People raped both the sons and the daughters in the streets. And, and they ate until they got fat and drank until they got drunk. And doing anything but positive, but all negative in their home and in their community. This, these were the days of Noah. And he and his family witnessed anarchy with no order in place. No one to recognize authority to stop foolishness. It was every man for himself and God for us all to the point that the wickedness of humankind had made God sick just to look at it, and it broke his heart. That humankind had was wanting to think only about evil thoughts, and it angered God to the point of no return. And when we read verse 7 of chapter 6 of Genesis, when we read according to the American Standard, and Jehovah said, I will destroy man whom I have created, from the face of the earth, both men and beasts, creeping things and birds of the heavens, for repented me that I have made them. However, Noah, interesting enough, did something different in this day of anarchy that his great-great-grandfather Enoch had done, and that is walk with God. In chapter 6, in Genesis, verse 8 and 9, tells us a unique characteristic about Noah when it reads, But Noah found favor in the eyes of Jehovah. These were the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man and perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. Right here we need to stop and look at one phrase which is a clarion call to generations to come, walking or walked with God. 
throughout the entire 66 books of the canonical Bible, the term or the phrase walk with God only shows up three times. Enoch walked with God and begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And Enoch walked with God. And he was not, for God took him. These are the generations of Noah. And Noah was a righteous man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. I'm talking about no one can challenge and defeat the cause of Almighty God. The Bible tells us those who walk with God were able to connect with the eternal wisdom of Almighty God. The Bible tells us those who walked with God were able to connect with the essential part of the heart of Almighty God. The Bible tells us those who walked with God were able to escape, escape both death and destruction, but only if you walk with God. If you walk with God, you connected with the eternal. You understood the essential, and you escaped utter destruction. I'm talking about no one can challenge or defeat the cause of Almighty God. To me, the three times walk with God shows up reminds me of the Heavenly Father who is pleased. The Son is blessing, and the Holy Ghost is present. To me, three times Walk with God shows that reminds me that the prophet Isaiah was correct when he declared in Isaiah 9, 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. To me, the three times walk with God shows up reminds me that the apostle Paul was correct when he declared what then shall we say to these things? For if God be for us, who can be against us? I'm talking about no one can challenge or defeat the cause of Almighty God. For Paul goes on to say, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or anguish or persecution or famine or nakedness or pearl or sword? Even as it is written, for the sake we are killed all the day long, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor present things, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of Almighty God which is Christ Jesus, our Lord. No one can challenge or defeat or the cause of Almighty God. Now I understand the songwriter when they wrote, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, I know he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. In a world around me, I see his loving care. Through my heart grows weary, I will never, never will despair. I know that he is leading through all the stormy blasts. The day of his appearing will come at last. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me, he talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. No one can challenge and defeat the cause of Almighty God.
you know. There are many that doubt that there is a place called heaven. And a campaign for God is an exercise in futility. However, I'm reminded that the poet, the Roman poet Spirilla gives us the words of empowerment that we need to remember as I leave you today in regards to our future. There is no thrill in easy sailing when the skies are clear and blue. There is no joy in merely doing things in which anyone can do. But there is some satisfaction that is mighty sweet to taste when you reach a destination that you thought you'd never make. There is no one that can challenge and defeat the cause of Almighty God. I hope today's message encourages you to let you know that in spite of what our circumstances might be, in spite of what you might feel, God's still in charge. He still knows what you need. At the end of this tape, I ask you to spend some time with him and find out for yourself that no one can challenge and defeat the cause of Almighty God. Now, because there's been so much news about the Kenora virus, we wanted to be able to share at the end of this tape a scientific report that we thought people might appreciate. Until we see you next time, God bless you, God keep you. And I hope you let God and this Christ I speak of into your life today. God bless you, God keep you. Until we meet again.
Now is the time to listen to the experts. Scientists are our best hope to end the coronavirus pandemic. Research labs around the world are racing to create a new vaccine. The idea is to simulate an infection while avoiding the possibly severe symptoms of COVID-19. Once vaccinated, our immune system should destroy the virus if we are exposed to it. According to the WHO, there are currently more than 60 teams of scientists working on a vaccine. Under normal circumstances, it would take more than 10 years. But thanks to previous research efforts, there is a chance this process may be fast-tracked, with human trials already underway in some cases. But scientists agree that it will still take months until a vaccine is approved. When will a corona vaccine be ready? A vaccine that enables us to resume our lives without restrictions while protecting us from the disease. I'm afraid we need to be patient and keep our distance for a while longer. And let scientists do their job. Like here in Berlin, where a biotech company comes up with promising results. Berlin is empty. Those who can are staying at home. But these lab technicians can't work from home. For them, there's more work than ever. The chemists at the JPT Peptide Company are regarded as systemically important, since what they're producing here could speed up the search for a coronavirus vaccine. We're creating peptide-based tools that enable the vaccine developers to monitor the immune systems of patients in treatment and attract them over a certain period of time. Peptides are amino acid chains that make up proteins. This company creates hundreds of thousands of them and assembles them so that they resemble the coronavirus's most important surface proteins. The scientists have been working on this project since January. Their work will contribute to research about the possible effectiveness of a vaccine. In the race for a coronavirus vaccine, some scientists are focusing on the development of vaccines based on messenger RNA, or mRNA. This involves injecting a person with the instructions for part of the virus. This would then spur the body to partially produce the virus. This, in turn, encourages the immune system to develop antibodies. Then, if the real coronavirus strikes, the person would be well-equipped and able to defend himself or herself. Whether that will really work is what's being tested with the tools being developed here. JPT's technology has already been used in the fight against the Zika virus and Ebola. The Berlin-based company is indirectly involved in the race for a vaccine, since it belongs to BioNTech, a German company at the forefront of the vaccine race. But for JPT, it's not about competition. I think that's the wrong way of looking at it. At the moment, it's really about getting a vaccine onto the market. It doesn't matter who does this in the end. It's about making a contribution and maybe being among the first to do so. But right now, it's truly about fulfilling the ethical duty to help. The technicians here seem to feel the same way. Yes, absolutely. You think you can contribute to making people healthy or even healing them. It's very motivating. Yes, sure. But I do have mixed feelings. On the one hand, I'm afraid. On the other, I know I have something important to contribute. It's exciting. It certainly is. A new test could be ready soon. And many are placing their hopes in the effectiveness of an mRNA-based vaccine. The whole world is waiting for a vaccine. But even though at least 60 teams of researchers around the globe are working to develop one, no one expects a rapid breakthrough because producing a vaccine goes through several stages and that takes time. Now, in a first step, the virus and its effects on the human body are analyzed. Now, this is necessary to determine the composition of the vaccine. Potential vaccines are first tested on animals and later on, this procedure is followed by testing human volunteers. Now, if all those tests are successful, 
the vaccine has to go through a lengthy approval process. And only after that, mass production can begin. Now, this process usually takes up to 15 years, but thanks to new technologies, development can go a lot faster today. And for more, I'm joined by Klaus Zichotek, president of the Paul Ehrlich Institute. That's the German Federal Institute of Vaccines and Biomedicines. Good to have you with us. Uh, so, first of all, I mean, should uh, a COVID-19 vaccine be fast-tracked? And if so, what stage would be best to skip? Definitely, we are fast-tracking the development and there's nothing to skip, but rather to combine, which means uh, we're given highest priority at the Paul Ehrlich Institute to the developments and to our regulatory advice. And in terms of, uh, let's say, shortening the development time, what we're doing is there are a focused number of animal studies that have to be done, for example, general pharmacology, toxicology, or defining the dose in animals that will be applied uh, to humans in the first step. And then, uh, of course, um, we also have to combine clinical trial phases. So there is discussion whether some of the developers would combine phase one, phase two, or phase two and three, and uh, increase maybe the number of uh, general subjects that will be enrolled in these studies. But we need to be very careful with the assessment and with the development as usual. But of course, we can concentrate, focus, and shorten times. All right. Well. I Time, of course, is of the essence uh, of, of all those studies uh, underway at the moment. Which one is the most promising, you say? Well, I think we need a variety of um, COV-2 vaccine developments. Uh, what we're prioritizing currently and also the developers are prioritizing is RNA, DNA vaccines and also vectored vaccines because they have the advantage that we know exactly which parts of the genetic information and safe genetic information of the pathogen can be included in the vaccine. We know this from preparatory research work also at the Paul Ehrlich Institute on most coronavirus vaccines. And in that respect, I think we are safe. OK, but what, what about uh, production capacity? Developing a vaccine is one thing, but then once we have it, will there be enough for everyone? And should everyone get it? I think, first of all, uh, those who are at risk should get it first, uh, at risk for severe causes of uh, COVID-19, but also at risk for being infected, uh, maybe at more risk than others. And number two, manufacturing will be no issue. Specifically, the RNA and DNA vaccines can be manufactured in a large amount of doses in quite a short time. We're talking about a million doses or so within a time period of four weeks. And that's the real advantage of these new vaccine platforms, as we say. And uh, by the time we have a vaccine, the pandemic will quite probably have peaked. Are we actually working on a vaccine for a future pandemic? Yes, we are. I think uh, we learned already from uh, the Ebola epidemic that we had in West Africa. And we're taking these kind of learnings to the development here of the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, but uh, we will use the time in any case to develop these platforms so that we are ready and uh, quicker ready than this time to have a vaccine if the next pandemic may arise. All right, Professor Zichotek there from the German Federal Institute of Vaccines and Biomedicines. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Now, time to address more of your questions. Uh, and please do keep them coming on YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitter or via email. Because our resident corona expert, DW's Derek Williams, stands ready to provide some answers. The WHO says getting vaccinated against pathogens that cause respiratory ailments like pneumonia is always a good idea, particularly for the elderly. But unfortunately, vaccines against a bacterial infection will not prevent you from getting the COVID-19 pneumonia caused by the coronavirus because it's a viral pneumonia. So a vaccine against a bacterial pneumonia won't stop it. Many health authorities are currently, however, also recommending getting vaccinated against the flu. That won't prevent you from getting COVID-19 either, 
but it will hopefully cut down on the number of severe flu cases that end up in the hospital occupying a bed that might be desperately needed by a COVID-19 patient. One thing that's really crippling us in this pandemic is that we don't know exactly who has had COVID-19. An unknown large number of people have gotten it, but don't know. They were never tested because they had mild symptoms or they had maybe no symptoms at all. That's incredibly important information though, because it could tell us who is now probably immune to the coronavirus. It's information that going forward is going to be essential as we try to get our societies back up and running. And that's where an antibody test comes in. It works like this. When it's infected with a pathogen, your body forms these proteins called antibodies. They're part of its immune response, and the antibodies it makes are tailored to that specific bug. Those antibodies remain in your system after you've gotten over the illness, helping to protect you from reinfection. An antibody test is a diagnostic for detecting them. So an antibody test for COVID-19 could tell us if you had it and maybe didn't even notice it. If that's the case, then you would theoretically no longer carry the bug or be able to infect anyone else and you could get back to work. Well, the short answer to this is, is yes. What you're talking about here is what health professionals call a false negative. That means when someone with an active infection tests negative for the disease, even though they actually have it. One reason that could happen is that the test is, is simply not sensitive enough. A study from China indicated that current testing methods might return false negatives up to 30% of the time, but we still don't have a lot of data there. There will also be a time window at the beginning of an infection when the active infection won't yet show up in PCR, experts say possibly up to a week. Um, your chance of getting tested in this window are generally low though, as you're likely to not be showing many symptoms so early in the course of the infection, though that obviously depends on the testing strategy in your home country. Um, antibody tests for revealing previous infection likely won't be perfect either. From an epidemiological standpoint though, these tests are there to help reveal potential clusters. A lot of doctors are saying that if you know you've been exposed and or you have symptoms, you need to take the appropriate measures in terms of isolation, even if your test came back negative. 